Good morning, dear saints, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. Today is Friday, September 27th, and you're listening to the program where each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. Well, I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. We're back in Revelation today. We're going to be in the second half of chapter 2, verses 12 through 29. And now the revelation is directed toward Pergamum and Theatira, or Theatira. I haven't decided how I'm going to pronounce it yet. Well, they're in Asia Minor, and the Lord is speaking to the believers there, commending their faith, yet warning against embracing false teachings and immoral practices. He calls them to repent and hold firmly to the truth, promising rewards to those who overcome. So in a culture filled with conflicting messages as they were, how vigilant are we in guarding our faith against compromise? Thy Strong Word is supported in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. With over 5.8 million books distributed across 145 languages, LHF provides essential Christian resources at no cost, helping people deepen their faith with books in their own language. Whether it's around the globe or just down the street, discover how they can support your ministry at lhfmissions.org. And if something in today's discussion sparks within your head a thought, a question, a comment, a no way you can be right, I have to correct you right now, or you're just so overwhelmed with the intelligence and brilliance of my guest that you just have to tell us. I want to hear about all of those things, good and bad. You're, I want you to be a part of the conversation. The best way to do that is to email me, thystrongword at kfuo.org. That really works out the best. I have your comments here. I can fit them in when it makes sense, so send me an email. You can also connect with me on X at Pastor Boo or on Facebook, but I don't check those during the show. So if you want me to check it during the show, thy strong word at KFUO.org is the way to go. All right, let's welcome our guest. He's a regular guest. You know who he is. It's the Reverend Stephen Tice. He's the pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in New Wells, Missouri. Brother, you're on the show so often, I don't often take the opportunity to ask you, how are things going? How are things going in New Wells, Missouri, with you and the Saints of Emmanuel? Well, things, things are going well at the moment, uh, in my assessment, and we're dealing with a couple of simple things. This congregation has gone through a, a series of changes starting back in 2000, December of 2000, when their serving pastor, uh, because of uh, heart problems, actually was called home by the Lord. And mm -hmm. so in uh, February of 2021, I began serving them as a vacancy pastor and have been there since then. So they have recently made arrangements with another parish in our circuit to form a joint parish uh, ministry. And so they're in the process now of completing that um, approved join, uh, joint work together and then and, and God willing their work in the next month or so, they plan to compile a list of pastors to call to serve those two parishes. So I'm, I'm in the status of watching things work as the Holy Spirit does things in his time and his plan. Meantime, we're doing confirmation instruction. We've got kids from three different parishes that are in a uh, group together. We've got eight kids in that group. So it's always an exciting time for me to get together with them. I do that once a week on Wednesday evenings. They've been in school all day, and I'm all hyped up and ready to go, and some of them are hyped up and some of them aren't. So. But, but that, that for me is very exciting to be able to interact with different age people around the Word of God. And, and, uh, and we're just completing a Sunday morning Bible study on the book of Hebrews, so we're, we're at a point where we're going to move into the topic of how to relate to a um, postmodern or non-foundational society. I'm using big terms here. It really sure. means a non-Christian worldview community. And if yeah, we look at Revelation, the seven churches, I mean, literally, there is no Christian worldview yet to be had when, when right. the, the Revelation is written. So we're really looking at the same culture almost 2,000 years apart. And that's what I think is just so wild about this. Even when, and you can disagree with me, you have a lot more experience than I do, but, but even when I started ministry um, a short 15 years ago or so, um, I feel like the culture has, has changed even dramatically in that tiny short amount of time and so much more over the decades. 
I, I think mm-hmm. we used to be, and I've moved around too, so that helps me get a little bit more of a perspective growing up in the deep south. You know, everybody you knows some kind of Christian. But I think that's sure. kind of how it was in America in general, except for maybe the most populated areas. And so I think the church is having to relearn how to interact with people who we, we can no longer assume that they even have a, a connection to our worldview because things are just so much different. Oh, yeah, and that's definitely part of the, the whole section of, of what we're looking at with you know the, the letter to the churches, the, the different churches, but the whole understanding of a, uh, Balaam and, and the history there, what that involved, and how in his time how people looked at things, and then the, the Jezebel controversy in Thyatira, um, you know, this this is really actually the same cultural context we are in. As I was reading through this and looking at some of the, the material here, it, it's really contextually the idea that the assumption that everybody has the same view of things. There was, as you said, 15 years ago even, much more of a, a commonly accepted rule of this is the norm by which society functions. That norm is no longer there. And when I use the term norm, as, as Lutheran pastors, you and I are familiar with the term, the norming norm and the norm which has been normed, or the norma normans, <laughs> norma normata in Latin, for people who are not familiar with those terms, the Bible is the thing that sets the norm. It's the, the ruler, the yardstick, the measurer. And then the Lutheran confessions have been held up against Scripture, and we as Lutherans say these are correct presentations of biblical doctrine. So they've been measured against the yardstick, which, by the way, is one of the terms in our in our text for today. The the rod, measuring rod, was one of the terms that, that applies to that too. So we had we had a I'm going to call it an agreed standard that says this is the standard set and this one matches it so we can use both. We live in a culture right. today that says we don't accept either of your standards. But as the Reverend Dr. Paul Faust, now asleep in Jesus, once put it, you know, if, if you have somebody that says, I don't believe what you believe, that doesn't mean you give up on what you're saying, uh, because you believe the truth is still there. They don't have to acknowledge it to be true for you to use it to their benefit. And I think <laughs> that I, we need to hang on to. Oh, that's so good, too. It really is. By the way, the Norm Norman and Norm Normata and all that good stuff, I busted out those the other day on one of my uh, my uh, Ph.D. papers, so I was proud oh, that you good. brought them up. <laughs> well, there you but, go. But the principles behind it are so actually much simpler than the Latin sometimes makes it sound, right? Because yep. we want to measure everything we do by the Scriptures. And then, of course, even our confessions – are measured in their truthfulness by the scriptures and have found to be uh, a correct exposition. But even when it comes to our daily lives, we have to measure everything by the scriptures. And you're right. I'm glad you're making these connections to our text. We are going to jump into it. But we, yeah, we have so much in common with these messages. Uh, it's, it's pretty easy, I think, to start making connections on how we can use John's experience and Jesus's revelation here in our own lives. All right, so let's go ahead. Let's kick it off. Let's start with a word of prayer, and then I'll dive in by starting up with verse 12. All right. We, uh, we remind our listeners and hearers that today we are approaching the, uh, the observance of St. Michael and All Angels Day on this coming Sunday, September 29th. And that obviously applies to this section of Revelation. So we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty and gracious God, you have not left us without witness. You have sent to us your Son, Jesus. Gracious Lord Jesus, you did not leave us without testimony, but appointed the apostles and the evangelists to bring that word to us. And then by the work of your Spirit, Holy Spirit, touching and working in the lives of your church, you sent the angels to the churches of Asia Minor. And as John recorded the revelation you gave to him, we see today even your angels at work sometimes noticed by us, often not noticed, but they do your work. Bless our study together of your word. Guide us through the work of the Holy Spirit in that word, and strengthen us by the care and support of your holy angels who still guard and protect your church against the attacks of the evil one and those who would destroy it, knowing that you are the bright morning star and that you continue to shine in the darkness, that life might be shared and those who do not know you might be brought into the light. 
bless our sharing of your word, and guard and protect those attacked either by Satan's work or by storm and disaster in our nation or throughout the world, that the holy angels watch over them and keep them safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm just going to read the first two verses. I don't want to go too fast because there's so much good stuff in here, but essentially the first, uh, verse 12 through verse 17, is the first uh, message, revelation, letter, so to speak, uh, to Pergamum. And we're going to start there. But just with the first two verses. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. All right, so he's going to go, so he's complimenting them, right? This is the uh, pretty, Mm -hmm. so far, typical, uh, what we might call a, um, um, uh, I don't want to say gospel law dynamic, right? <laughs> but because it's not really gospel, no. it's talking about what they've done. But he certainly sure. acknowledges, and and we should too acknowledge when Christians are standing up, even if there are some some errors <laughs> amongst them. Uh, we're all going to make errors. I think it, we we should do more to highlight Christians standing up to tyranny. But that's what they're doing. But but goodness gracious, this yeah. is Jesus's words. But what is he talking when he says Satan's throne is? Uh, I, I'm having a feeling this isn't a literal. This is another uh, a metaphor. Yeah, I, th- I think this would be one of those ways where we, we look at the the time they live in, the culture, and, and the idea of Satan's throne is that the the life and work of, of Satan's evil angels uh, suffering for the church, you know, they, they're dealing with the fact that the prince of this present age, or the prince of this darkness, as he's sometimes called in Scripture, continues to attack the church and Christians. And and if we misunderstand that thought, that we have a spiritual warfare, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. The, the Christians there in Pergamum are not going to hear this message if they are not reminded that Satan lives among them. They may also have the mistaken idea that God has abandoned them, and, and this one is very clearly now being corrected, this false idea. The the one who stands now among them sends the thing of his sharp two-edged sword. And and that's, as I have frequently talked about when I look at Ephesians 6, you know, the only offensive weapon in that list of the whole armor of God is, in fact, the word, the sword of the word. And it's two-edged so that it can defend and it can attack. Now, obviously, that's not the implication of two-edged. It means it's sharp and, and cuts both ways. And your reference to both law and gospel here. They've continued to use that sword of the word, and that's why they're able to stand in the midst of the attacks. And and so the one who is writing to them says, I hold the sword, the word of God that you've been holding firm to, it can't fail. But at the same time, they're in the midst of suffering. So he's reminding them that they're going to suffer and it's going to be hard. And when they look at this understanding of of this two-edged sword back in Revelation chapter 1, it talks about this God who is the one who holds the sword. And Jesus, the defender of his people, has come. Um, the church has suffering, and they're going through suffering, but they are not without a defender among them. And you hold to my name and have not denied my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness. And we don't know who that is, but the other thing about Revelation and these seven letters in particular is the recipients of the seven letters know exactly what he means when he uses these terms that to us are kind of obscured. The next right. one, Thyatira talks about Jezebel. They know who that is. Now, we don't. Historically, the, the record is a little bit vague, and church historians have indicated they think it might have been X, Y, or Z, but the, but the whole point is the people receiving this letter knew what was being referred to. And this is the key, to me at least, for understanding all of Revelation. It is the people of God in daily life who see the attacks of Satan and are being reminded that they don't see everything. Mm -hmm. There's more than what we see. We walk by faith and not by sight, as the Apostle writes. By highlighting this Antipas guy, who we don't know, yeah, it, it also shows us, I think, that God sees where we don't, too. Like, to, I guess to one more step past what you were saying is that God sees uh, all the struggling that you're doing. He sees your faithfulness. 
And while Antipas probably was regionally famous for him uh, giving up his life in the cause, standing up against uh, persecution, um, mm-hmm. there are plenty of people who in many ways, maybe per- perhaps not to martyrdom, but in many ways are struggling against uh, the forces of this world that would want to, to lead Christians astray, and they feel so alone, and they feel like no one knows them. And so I think that whenever we read anybody in Bible mentioned by name, it's always just a healthy reminder that, yeah, they would have known who he was talking about. That's important. But even more important is God knows exactly who he's talking about. And God sees even Mm -hmm. when we don't. So, yeah, I I think that should encourage us, too, that there is absolutely um, uh, when we feel like it's just not fair and no one recognizes our struggles. Well, God does see and recognize. And that's and that's um. And that's yeah. better than any sort of worldly accolade. Yeah. And, and just one other thought here, this, this reference to the one who has a sharp two-edged sword. And mm-hmm. talking about, you may have spent some time with this earlier, the whole understanding of what we call apocalyptic literature or eschatological literature. The book of Daniel has some of these things. And, and it, I'm just reminded that the name Daniel means God is my judge. Mm-hmm. And here we have a church that's referred to as I have something against you, so there's some judgment going there. But they have a defender who stands with them. He is not a a, uh, disinterested individual who judges. He is also on their side at the same time. So the judgment God brings is not to punish but to correct. And I think for us as Christians, we, we struggle with how we handle the law. The law points out our sin. But when God comes among us with judgment, he doesn't come to punish. He comes to turn us back to him because Christ already paid for our guilt. What God does with judgment is he says, you are not seeing things the right way. I will change your perspective so that you turn to me and receive that which I've already promised you. And in this ongoing struggle we have as Christians with our own sinful nature, when God allows us to suffer, it helps us to to literally stop for a moment and say, okay, what am I focused on? Why am I doing what I'm doing? And the God who corrects us does it for our good, discipline as opposed to punishment. And and this idea that we have uh, we have a judge, which is remains true, of course, uh, that Jesus is our judge and defender, which is you know it's that <laughs> that's like cheating in our favor, thank the Lord. Uh-huh. Uh, but we also have an accuser. We have a prosecuting accuser, and that's Satan, of course. Of course, God certainly puts us to the test and checks us out too, as any good judge mm-hmm. would. But the one who's always throwing our sins in front of our face and God's is that prosecutor. And so, yeah, connecting even that imagery of the two-edged sword uh, with uh, the judgment of Jesus, but also Satan's throne being where, and again, is that like specifically the altar to Zeus or something like that? Probably, but but more generally, as you pointed out, that they are in the midst of, of, of people who are thinking the way that, that Satan would have us think, away from God. But but he's he's complimenting them, which is good. But as you already indicated, he does have some things against them. So here are the charges. Actually, these are more than charges. These are already adjudicated. He knows. So he says in verse 14, I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. All right, he has one more verse here, but let's just look at these. A couple things to unpack. The teaching of Balaam. Remember Balaam and Balaam's talking donkey? Is that the Balaam he's talking about? That is the one. And, you <laughs> so know, why does things... Balaam show up? Yeah. Well, I think, uh, and, and I'm, Indebted to my former professor, the late sainted Reverend Dr. Lewis Brighton, for some of these ideas. Just oh, understand. Sure. I couldn't figure them out on my own, but in class, Louis shared them with us, and then he, he jotted them down for everybody to have as well. But this, this understanding that if you look carefully at what Balaam was doing, he would come to uh, Balak, who, Balak, however you want to pronounce that fine name, who said, I want you to curse the Israelites. And, and Balaam said, Well, I'm going to consult with Yahweh uh, about whether I can or not. And Dr. Brighton highlights that it was common in the ancient world in a kind of a syncretistic 
or polytheistic world uh, to assume that the gods of other people could be consulted to find out what they planned. <laughs> or to put it another way, if you were tricky enough, you could sneak up on the enemy before they knew what you were doing, and you did it through the god they worshipped. Now, you and I don't understand that concept at all. No, that's hard, right. Yeah, but what, what Balaam was doing is he was saying, okay, I'll take your money, but I won't say anything that Yahweh doesn't say. And, and so he's, he's pushing, uh, playing both ends against the middle. He wants the money, but he wants to, to, to be on the right side, too. And as Jesus points out, you can't serve two masters. You know, you can't serve God and money. You'll love the one and hate the other, despise one and care for the other. And, and this is the problem with, with Balaam. It's, it's one thing to eat your cake and have it, too. Because everybody has to have their cake and eat it, too, because you can't eat it until you have it. But to eat it and still have it, that's the tricky part. Um, and, and what Balaam wants is he wants both. And that's the sin that they're, they're being accused of. They want to be Christian, and at the same time, they want to have the other things that they must give up, as Antipas obviously had to, to be faithful to Christ. And, and so what it sounds like to me, at least, the angel message is you're trying to be a servant of two masters and that can't work and I won't allow it. That would, in my opinion, be the understanding of, of uh, Balaam, uh, the sin of Balaam. And, and uh, the way that that works in our world today is, is the mistaken idea that if we understand another person's worldview, we'd be able to, to equip ourselves to contest with them or gain an advantage over them. But but uh, that's an agnostic or atheistic approach to the polytheistic approach of this, I'll use the term, cross-cultural consultation, where you go against the person by finding out what their God would be teaching, and then you attack from right. the inside out. And, and it, that human approach is still very common, and it's based on our understanding that with the right information, we can win. And what the Revelation says is, you won't have the right information. I'm going to show you some things you need to know but you will win because I am with you, and I am the ruling one, and I hold this two-edged sword. And all the phrases that are used in these visions to the seven churches or revelations to the individual seven churches, this is the God who says, I'm showing you what you're not seeing, so that when you don't see what you want to see, you know I'm still with you. And again, this whole understanding of the revelation is that it's showing what is hidden, and, and if we don't recognize that it's not a linear presentation, but a, a overview of multiple levels of spiritual and, and church life and the world around us from different perspectives, then it becomes very confusing. And so I think the, the introduction with these seven uh, letters to the seven churches is, a, is so key for us as, as we read through the whole book to say there's more than meets the eye in this book. But what's shown to us is enough to know that Christ is the victor, and we are to walk with him no matter how things look. You know, and one of the things they were struggling with, again, that connects today, it also is, uh, follows your good advice, is that we hear about the Nicolaitans. This is the second time. Now, these mm -hmm. Nicolaitans were wanting them to do these compromises. In fact, that was kind of their position I looked yeah. up just briefly the Nicolaitans because, again, we we hear about them a couple of times, not a whole lot. In fact, I think this is going to be it. But 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 the Nicolaitans, evidently from other histories, uh, were uh, formed because they followed a man named Nicholas, who was the deacon of the church in Jerusalem, who, along with Stephen and others, was ordained by Peter into the deaconate. And uh, mm -hmm. apparently he abandons his wife because of her beauty. Um, uh, and then uh, so that other people could enjoy her, quote, and then the practice was turned into debauchery and partners were being exchanged. So, again, a lot of uh, sexual mm -hmm. deviancy caught oh, up yeah. with their pagan worship. And I think sure. that's worth pointing out, not just to be kind of titillating on the radio. It's worth pointing out because a lot of the things we see today are sexual deviancies against God's norm. So just sure. another, when people lament, oh, things have never been this bad, they have. They have. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think the, the reference you're talking about, Irenaeus is, is one who records that, that this was a group of, he uses a term that today we call antinomians. They said the, the mm -hmm. law had wiggle room, if you will. Um, and it, it 
then provided license, as you just indicated, that the uh, Nicholas was one who then gave up his relationship with his wife, that others might have, again, license, opportunity. Right. And the, as I was review, reviewing that and thinking about it, the, the thing that popped into my mind, and this will cause some people distress and some will be offended by it, and not my intention, it's my intention to help them understand something. The The whole idea behind what some Christians today want to endorse or permit with the LGBTQ XYZ groups is very simply that there's no alpha or omega in those letters. Right. It is not the word of God, but they want to allow license with this false understanding that others can benefit if we're tolerant. Again, this this antinomian opposed to the law viewpoint of, of the Nicolaitans, who, by the way, according to Eusebius, didn't last very long. Yeah, right. They're right. definitely active here. And, you know, I happen to have a copy of, of uh, Eusebius' church history book that was put out years ago, and uh, Paul Meyer helped translate that. So occasionally I, I do some reading in ancient church history translated into English because I don't want to spend all the time doing it in Greek. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, you know, at the so exactly, this is a, a group that was sort of fly by night. If you agree with Eusebius, yeah, I read uh, Irenaeus in his uh, against uh, heresies, some portions mm -hmm. of them, and the stuff I got was actually from another guy too. So it, they were well known, but again, they burned hot and burned out fast. But boy, the spirit continues today, because the spirit yeah. of all heresy, uh, oftentimes I shouldn't say always, but oftentimes is grounded in a desire to actually do a good thing. You know, no one wakes up to mm -hmm. say, I'm going to be a heretic today. You no, know, yeah. people just get misled to think that they have a better way than what God has revealed. Or that, uh, you know, it, and it's certainly a, a, a misrepresentation of what God wants us to do, but it's also worth that the real heresy comes in when you refuse to be corrected. And that's where these guys yeah. eventually became heretics. Anyway, we're right up against a break a little over, but we're going to take it now. So folks, don't go anywhere. When we come back from these messages, we'll finish up chapter two in Revelation. See you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan316. Welcome back, friends, to Thy Strong Word. I'm the host, Pastor Phil Boo, and with me today is my guest, the Reverend Stephen Tice. He's the pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in New Wells, Missouri. Before we jump back into it, though, just a reminder of that way to reach out to me. Karen did and Becky did the day before, so if you'd like to reach out, you can. It's thystrongword at kfuo.org. Um, even if you just want to say hi, it, it's always nice to hear from you. So you can tell me where you're listening from and by what means you're listening, right? Is it over the air on 8.50 a.m. in St. Louis? Is it using this uh, the KFUO app on your phone? Is it uh, as a podcast or maybe you live stream it from the KFUO website? I'd love to hear that stuff. All right. So uh, let's get right back to it. No more waffling. Uh, we're going to finish up this little section by reading verse 17. This is the end of the revelation, the message, the letter to the angel at Pergamum. It says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. So folks at home, you can see why I saved that. Um, I, 
I don't know. <laughs> what in the world, brother, does that mean? I mean, you can see how these things would be really open to a lot of speculation over a couple thousand years. Uh, what does he yeah. mean by hidden manna, white stone? Well, I think partly uh, what's involved here is you go back to um, the Old Testament and you have the, the bread of angels in Psalm 78. And manna is referred to as the bread of angels there. And, and so we have this understanding that, that this is a spiritual thing. And, of course, the, the hidden manna, uh, Dr. Brighton highlights that various people have drawn connections to the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, where in, with, and under bread and wine, body and blood are hidden. And, and then the marriage feast of the, the Lamb, the feast to come, coming up in chapter 19, all of these things tie together. Um, easily thinking of the new name, a baptismal name, baptized into Christ, we, and the ancient practice of literally christening, when a person was baptized, they were given a new name that wasn't the name they had, particularly as adults. When they were baptized, they were given a new Christian name to replace the one they had as, as their ancestral community had used pagan words or concepts. Many adult converts, when baptized, were literally given a new name. And so this concept in North American culture is not nearly as clear as it would have been in that time. It's um, funny you say that. The The other day, I just want to interject, the other day I was at, where was I? Uh, I think it was at the hospital. It was some place where I needed to give my name. And they actually said, so what's your Christian name? Just like that. You know, as sort wow, of a, yeah. um, you know, it is a phrase I've heard before, but not one sure. you hear very mm-hmm. often. It's like, oh, um, I guess yeah. it's the same as my regular name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. But again, that's where that idea comes from. The christening of ships is tied to that whole idea, too. Um, but the white stone one, uh, apparently the indication is that at some point in ancient times, uh, voting was done by a judge who would put a white stone in to indicate a innocence. Uh, but also white is the color of clean and pure, and Jesus is the, the cornerstone upon which all things are built. So anytime you come across the word stone or rock in Scripture, you almost have to go back to what are all the other references where, you know, this is the stone from which you were hewed, uh, you know, the, all these things that when you have the whole context of Scripture, one word can bring in multiple images. But uh, probably in this cult- cultural context for the or the uh, the people in Asia Minor, this would have been much more related to a judge voting you as innocent. And again, getting back to what we said earlier about the one who comes mm-hmm. as our judge. So this is a lot about the spiritual food, manna, wisdom that comes only from God. That's why it's hidden. I never, I never heard, or actually didn't read even in uh, um, Brighton. I need to read more carefully. I didn't, I didn't connect it with the Lord's Supper, but I love that. I do love that connection, although it might be a little stretch, but I do love it. But the idea that Jesus is the one that is, is uh, the hidden source of true nourishment and the white mm-hmm. stone, um, you know, you have been redeemed, given a new identity in Christ. Uh, those things, I think, carry over even as we struggle with the actual meanings of some of these references. Although I think you're dead on with uh, the ones that you provided here. Uh, but sometimes, you know, we have to remember that, yes, they would have understood these things. But as we figure them out, God still is speaking to us, not with a new message, but with the same message. Mm-hmm. And in this case, we have a new name in Christ. So with our new name, how does this affect how we live, Right. Yeah, we, we uh, are you ready to move on or anything else yeah, before we're live. we do? Yeah, no, no, I, I'm, I think so. Uh, the other, the other thing I wanted to throw in was the word sacrament for a hidden manna, and that's a Greek word that gets translated into sacrament in Latin is the word mysterion. And so I think if you start throwing in those Greek words along with the hidden manna, suddenly it gets that depth of moving into the sacraments. That's I like it. No, I'm definitely going to reflect yeah. on that for sure after the show. Yeah. Let's okay. look at eighteen. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira, uh, uh, Thy- Thyatira, Thyatira, boy, that one's a tough for me. Here, I'm going to have my software pronounce it. Thyatira, it says. Here we go. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent 
of her sexual immorality. All right, so he's going to say, behold, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z because of this, but let's just start with mm-hmm. this, the, the compliment and the, the main accusation. Um, oh, oh, but first, how Jesus identifies himself with a yeah. pretty familiar um, description. It is. And, and this particular phrase, the Son of God, it's the only place it occurs in Revelation. Um, so elsewhere he's called the Son of Man, but um, the understanding that this is, in fact, the very true Son of God, the one who is the living and reigning Son of the Father. Um, very important to keep that thought in mind for the Greek culture uh, in particular had no problem with the gods interacting with humans to produce hybrid God, human urges, semi urges, you know, all those different kinds of things where you get, you know, um, in the Greek um, mythology or cosmology or any of the other ologies they came up with. So but Jesus is, um, I just want to interject, Jesus is incarnation then wouldn't have been, uh, even though they might not have understood it, and who does, but it wouldn't have been as scandalous to them as to the Jews. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's part of what I'm yeah. saying. But, it, but it's also, here he's saying, I'm claiming authority, and my authority is greater than that of Jezebel, um, because Jezebel claims to be a prophetess of some sort. And we don't, again, don't know who that is. Speculation has been made, but that's all it's going to be, is speculation. And I'm going to say something I think important. We don't have to know who it is to understand that she led people away from God, and that was the problem. So when we get right down to it, what Jesus is saying is, I am the Son of God. Jezebel is not the daughter of God. Don't listen to her lies. I think that's why it falls in this particular place. But he, he then comes among them with this clear understanding that as the one who was the Son of Man back in Revelation chapter 1, he's now bearing the sword. So the Son of God comes bearing the sword, and what he's bringing to these people of Theatira, um, uh, the city of Lydia, by the way, the seller of purple dye, a, com- a commercial center. This was, you know, fairly, fairly prosperous community. Again, cultural similarities to our our time today. What he's saying is, this woman, known to the church at that moment, was the one who was misleading people, and the people of the congregation were known for their works and their love of faith and service and how they endured, and. Then I know your last works are more than the first ones. Now we don't know what that means, right. but the Christians in that congregation did. And what he was saying is, what you've done more recently is far more significant than how you started out. That's a great word of encouragement to people in the midst of suffering and sorrow and difficulty and problems who are now about to hear, but you've got this problem. He's not. That this reminds me of the way Paul does many of his letters. He starts off by praising the Christians. Who are God's people for the way they've lived in their faith, and then he says, and now you got to deal with this problem you got. <laughs> right, but it's a good approach, well, isn't it? I mean, it's a good yeah. approach to just don't sure. un- don't as pastoral leaders, but also really in any of our interactions as Christians, you know, maybe don't lead with the thing that's going to cause a bunch of conflict. You know, yeah. set the groundwork. I, I, yeah, it just makes sense. Sure, and, uh, and now based on my own speculation here. The Apostle Paul didn't make this up on his own. He picked it up from somebody. I'm guessing the Holy Spirit directed him to think like Jesus and operate this way. But um, the whole point is, I have something against you. I've, I've got all kinds of good stuff to say about you. Now we're back to eyes like flame of fire, feet like burnished brass, and we're back in the, the visions of Ezekiel and Daniel again. So, you know, this is, again, I'm, apocalyptic literature, the eschaton, all of these things are part of in a cultural setting, saying this is not physical, normal life. This is true spiritual message that transcends the physical. And and for us, particularly in a world that's highly built on what I'd like to say is a scientific worldview in North America that ignores science most of the time, by the way, um, is the reality that, that the spiritual is true. And this is important for us in our culture today. The spiritual is true. It doesn't have to be verifiable by science to be true. And so what the the angel of the Lord coming to the church in Theatira is saying is, this is true, and now I'm going to show you where the problem lies. He starts off by saying, God sees the spiritual good in this congregation. And I try to remind the people of, of 
the parishes I've served and preached in that the Holy Spirit's at work among you. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. You know, when you go into a congregation, too, um, and I'm always very humbled whether I'm just visiting for one day to fill in a pulpit supply or whether I'm the new pastor, I'm always humbled by just the the length of tradition and history and the people that – you know, the pastors kind of come and go, but the people are there and building up roots and, and, and ministering to their community. I'm always humbled by that fact. Um, you want to make sure, though, that what the teaching that is happening is true. And it's sometimes really tough to highlight perhaps a false practice that may have maybe not even wasn't all that false, but maybe there's a little better way to do it without mm-hmm. people thinking that you're suddenly accusing them or their former pastor or whatever of being these you know, horrible, uh, you know, uh, uh, apostates. And it's like, no, no, you know? And so I think it's why it's really wise to go in understanding that you guys are doing so much good work here through the Lord. Um, here's just a way to do things better. But in this case, the situation is much more serious than just sort of changing practices. You got this woman, Jezebel, which is a euphemism for this, whoever she really is, but obviously someone who's calling herself a prophetess. Maybe she's maybe she's in cahoots with those Nicolaitan folks or those other Gnostic kind of guys. But regardless, Jesus is very concerned about their practice of sexual immorality, as he should be. But then we've seen a couple times, and to food, uh, eaten food sacrificed to idols. So I wanted to bring this up. I don't know if you uh, prepped for this, but I, I'm just thinking— so Paul, when he speaks on yeah. mm-hmm. uh, food sacrifice to idols, he's a lot more compassionate about it in the sense of the weaker brother argument. Jesus here seems to be a little more strict than Paul. Well, I think part of what's going on is the understanding that the term food sacrifice to idols really is a, I'm going to say a synecdoche. It's, it's a part for the whole where it incorporates the idea of worshiping false gods and idolatry. You know, it's, it's a term that gradually assumed a different level of meaning. Eating meat sacrificed to idols to the Corinthians when he first wrote to them was still the actual physical practice of eating the meat sold in the market. Right. But right. here in Revelation, later in time, this, this is much more the activity of involving yourself in the worship life of idol worship. It's, it's like we talk about, well, he had a home run. You know, and, and is the guy in the ballpark with a bat? No. <laughs> but we'll say regularly, wow, he hit a home run on that one. And if you're not familiar with American culture and don't understand baseball, you will not get that reference at all. But your explanation makes perfect sense to me. Um, and, mm-hmm. and let me see if I can break it down for folks at home that might not have caught it. Uh, and I didn't think of it this way, so I'm really gl- glad for you explaining this. So a synecdoche is, as he's been saying, when you refer to a hole by one of its parts. So, for instance, someone might roll up with a new car and you go, hey, nice wheels. But you're not necessarily talking about their wheels. You're talking about their entire vehicle. Uh, right. In this case, sexual immorality, especially when combined with the eating food sacrificed to idols, those two activities stand as a, a shorthand way of saying that they have invested everything and are working, uh, are, sorry, are worshiping in these pagan ways, which include, yeah. among so many other things, these two horrible things. As opposed right. to Paul when he was dealing with people who were like, I'm not worshiping in pagan places, but every now and then I encounter meat that's been sacrificed in a ritualistic way. Am I allowed to eat it? That's the two scenarios. And that makes a ton of sense. Yes. And I think that always oh, context is king for understanding scripture. And if, if you just pull a phrase out of the middle of nowhere and then talk on the phrase, mm-hmm. you can't get uh, the full sense, at least in my opinion, of what's being said. It's, it's like the, the term that shows up here in the next part about how he's going to judge Jezebel. Yep, just like our uh, our, uh, our our brother uh, Nabil Noor, Pastor Noor, he always likes to yeah. say, uh, "Context is I think context is queen." He says something something's uh-huh. king, but context is queen. I should remember okay. that he used it on my show recently. But let's go on, picking up now with uh, we'll repeat verse twenty one and and keep moving. Jesus says, "I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. So behold, I will throw her onto a sick bed." And those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. All right, let's pause it there. People talk about rewards in heaven, right? You know, the Bible even says there are rewards in heaven for your works. 
Um, it's funny because when you read a phrase like this from Jesus, I think it really reminds us that we shouldn't be counting on those rewards for our works. Most of our works are, are not something we want to be repaid for according to. So again, here, Jesus is really showing us that alien nature of God, that, that he is the righteous judge with some language that might make us uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this idea that we have anything to offer to God. All our righteousness is, is as old rags filled with blood that need be thrown away, to quote the Old Testament. Um, mm. this, this understanding that the one who says, I have this against this woman, um, whatever it is, she's going to be thrown into judgment, cast onto a sickbed. I gave her time to repent, but she didn't want, didn't want to. And that, I think that's a key phrase. Uh, did not wish to repent, did not desire to repent. There was no desire to change. This is different from you and me as sinful human beings who are sinning and wish we hadn't. This individual is being referred to as told of the sin and not even acknowledging that it was an offense against God that needed correction. And that's the essence of, of refusal to repent. It's acknowledging you did it, admitting it wasn't what God said, and you're not going to repent anyway. And, and what the, the angel is bringing the message here to the people of Theatira is, God says, repent. I've told this woman to, she didn't. Now I'm going to throw her into the deathbed throes of destruction. Sick bed is the term that's used here. But the purpose of this is to reveal what's in the heart, the innermost thoughts. That needs to be revealed. And, and the people of this congregation have, in one way or another, been misled by one who apparently wasn't showing them everything in her heart. And, and now the Lord's going to reveal what's in her heart so that they can see, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, be turned back to God. And that's the, the challenge for you and me, too. You know, we talked earlier about uh, heresy starting off with some, some good intentions or, or nobody starts off today saying, well, I'm going to wake up and be a heretic today. You know, it's, right. it's, yeah, and I think that's part of what's going on here is Satan does it in subtle stages. He doesn't start with the great offense. He starts with the little one. And as sinful human beings and a culture, too, you know, it reminds me of this whole idea of, of the idea of tolerance. Um, well, we don't ask you to approve of our behavior. We just want you to tolerate it. And I remember... I'm old enough to remember back when those who were advocating public and acceptance of homosexual behavior saying, we don't want approval, we just want to be tolerated. Now now they say, if you don't approve of us, we will persecute you and accuse you of breaking the law. So they lied to start with, and now today we see the full consequence of it. Like I said, I'm old enough to remember this. Not everybody is. But when they started, they said, we just want tolerance. Now they don't yeah. want tolerance. Now they want not only endorsement, but superiority. And, and that's what we're going to face any time the church tries, even with the best of intentions, to integrate with the culture or to adopt practices of the culture or to look the other way because of sins of the culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You will not win people to your side. In fact, by not standing up for the truth, and yes, of course do it in gentleness and love, but by not standing up to it, uh, with the truth rather, then mm -hmm. you're, you're going to fall for anything, as the cliche says. People are going to say, well, this is a people who do not believe in what they say. So it, it's not going to endear you to them. It's just going to give them fodder to accuse you more. Right. And following after those things are not just bad practice, but they really are deadly. They're deadly because you're going away from Christ. So uh, I, I wonder if in verse 23, when it says, I will strike her children dead, uh, if that's not an allusion to Second Kings and Yehu slaughtering Ahab's descendants, but maybe even just more generally, the children here aren't necessarily biological offspring of this particular woman, but right. rather those who follow after her ways, those who treat her now as their mother as opposed to God as their father. Am I on yeah, point, you think? Yeah, oh, I think so, too, especially because in that verse 23 phrase, so that all the churches will know. This, is, this isn't going to just be for right. Theatira. This is going to be so that all the churches know. And again, getting back to this symbolic number seven in the churches of the seven churches of Asia Minor and, and the totality of God's communication to his people of all times and in all places. The big mistake that any of us could make is reading these first uh, two chapters and looking at the seven churches of Asia Minor and saying, well, that was just for that time period. 
Mm-hmm. No, this is for the church of all time. And, and the understanding that those who want to adhere to the false teachings of the heretics of that time, no matter how they're redressed and, and repurposed today, will end up in the same category of on the throes of death, bedridden, and, and being destroyed by God. And, and the purpose of this is our struggle, personally, I think theologically, is we know the grace of God and the love of God, and, and it's easy for us to think that this God who forgives our sin would never destroy anyone because he's not that unloving. And what Scripture very clearly teaches is he is that righteous and just that when he does so, it's still love because he does not allow them to continue in their sinful disregard for him and his word. Now, it doesn't look like love to us, but it's the nature of God that when he applies his law, that's still love because God is love. And that's so foreign to our understanding of how God loves. Let's finish up our chapter, starting with verse 24. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast to what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give the authority over the nations, or I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken into pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's the end of the chapter, into this section, and we'll pick up with the rest of it next time. But, all right, so a couple things that are worth pulling pulling out in these last few minutes we have. Probably not enough time to do it justice. But uh, mm-hmm. uh, the deep things of Satan, I think we get. Hold fasting, I think we get. Sure. But what does it mean to have authority over nations with that rod of iron when he returns? Yeah, we'll, we'll be ruling with Christ when he comes again. And and this gets back to that rod of iron is a, is a tool of authority and of protection. And, and the, the term rod is used throughout Scripture. It can be a shepherd's staff or a king's scepter, it, it, Moses' walking stick, but also, as I mentioned earlier, a measuring rod to determine where do we mark the, the lines that are correct and incorrect. And the ruling is not done by us. It's God handing us the rod of iron that says, now you rule with this standard I've prepared. You're not making it up. You're following what I've given you. And that star of the morning is the last one to fade. Jesus, of course, is the bright morning star. There is no Lucifer, bearer of light involved. That's Satan. So the early Christian church now is being promised that they will reign with Christ, having been enlightened in Jesus Christ, called out of darkness. When the morning star returns, they'll stay in the light with him. And so will we. He's the morning star, Numbers 24, if you guys want to read a little bit more about where that might come from. But we are at the end of our time together. So I'd like to wrap up by thanking my guest this morning for coming on the show. He's been the Reverend Stephen Tice, pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in New Wells, Missouri. Again, thanks, brother, for being on. I can't wait to talk to you again. Thank you very much, and I hope nobody calls being impressed with my intelligence. That would be bad. <laughs> I'm sure they will. I'm sure they'll write in. They do. By the way, when that happens, I do pass them on to the guests uh, if they want me to, so I do that. So I'll send all, all right. the great messages I get about you. Hey, folks, tomorrow, well, though, uh, no, not tomorrow, Monday. Tomorrow I'm off, but Monday we're back in Asia Minor as we pick up with Chapter 3. Jesus is delivering critical messages to the churches in Sardis and Philadelphia. And our guests, our guests are always special, but we have a special guest, the Reverend Dr. Matthew Heisa. He's the executive director of the Lutheran Heritage Foundation, who also just happens to be our sponsor. So come listen to this episode on Monday. Hear Dr. Hess uh, unpack this for us. Talk a little bit about Lutheran Heritage Foundation, and you can hear me gush all over LHF. I don't do it because they're the sponsor. I'm glad they're the sponsor because I'm really proud of the work they do. All right. But I tell you what, that's going to be it. Oh, wait, that, that episode's going to be pre-recorded, just so you know. I'll be back live on Tuesday. So until then, Thank let's you. go ahead and wrap it up. May God's peace and blessings be with all of you as we sincerely pray. Father, keep us in thy strong word.